A game, a TV, a console, and a controller. These are all you usually need in order to play your favourite video games. However, sometimes it's fun to mix it up a little, and this is where peripherals come into play. Be they optional or mandatory, peripherals can help improve the gaming experience, and can help with the overall immersion of the game. However, for every well-made piece of gaming technology, there are those that never should have left the drawing board. These are the ones we are interested in today. Now a few ground rules to start off. Number one, this is my list, my choices. So if you think I've missed any or that I should have put one in a different position, be sure to write in the comments below. And number two, I'm doing this list from a British perspective, so if there's an American or Japanese one that I miss, well there's what the comments are for. Anyway, I'm Grandmaster Scott A, and these are the top 10 worst gaming peripherals. Number 10. The Master System Control Stick. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm left-handed. And pretty much all controllers and keyboard layouts are designed for a right-handed player, so for southpaws, it's a case of adapt or die. Not the case for Sega, it seems. As the first arcade stick made for one of their consoles was designed, it seems, for the left-handed gaming community. Problem is, apart from the ergonomic difficulties for the other 85% of people in the world who are right-handed, the joystick is way too big for its own good. I mean, honestly, it looks like someone stuck a Bourbon biscuit on top of a joystick. And the actual controller is way too light and way too small for its own good, and the stick itself was known for turning in players' hands, making it unaligned and difficult to use. Worth having as part of a Master System collection? Maybe. Worth having to play games with? I'd stick with the regular pads. Number 9. The Wii Speak. Now, online communication through consoles is no new idea. If anyone can remember the iToy, one of the games for this was basically an early version of Skype. That only let you talk to those who had iToy chat. And an iToy. And a PS2. And a network adapter. What I'm getting at is, the thing was a commercial failure. Anyway, back to Wii Speak. Released in 2008, the Wii Speak was a USB microphone that allowed you to talk to users over the Wii Speak channel. Kind of an audio-only version of Skype with some lip-sync me's, and it could be used in a few games, most notably Animal Crossing City Folk, which came bundled with the Wii Speak. Problem is, only 13 games were ever made compatible with the Wii Speak, and by 2010, barely two years after launching, Nintendo was supposedly telling developers to stop including compatibility, and judging from how the last game using the Wii Speak was made in November of that year, it's clear that this was another Nintendo peripheral that was quickly forgotten about by the company. Just like the Wii Zapple was. Number 8. The Cheetah Characteristics. Now, joysticks are something that you do not want to get wrong. After all, you want the buttons to be where they are, you want the controller to be not too light but not too heavy, and you want the thing to be comfortable control. These are not characteristics of the characteristics. See what I did there? Anyone? I'll shut up now. Anyway, these were joysticks created by an English company called Cheetah, modelled after licensed franchises like The Simpsons and Batman. Problem is, it seems that people were more worried about the license than the actual joysticks, as these things look good until you have to use them. Most of these things were extremely uncomfortable to use. I mean, look at this alien one. It's my hand a cramp just thinking about it. But look what's happened to the poor Terminator. It's like someone cut off his head and stuck it on a pike as a warning to other joysticks. Overall, there are a lot of these things online, so if you want one, they're fairly cheap to pick up. But just keep it on your shelf. As controllers, you can do a hell of a lot better. Number 7. The Nintendo E-Reader. Do you remember those Sega Master System games that came on cards? Remember how cool those things were? Well, Nintendo's effort over a decade later definitely was not as cool or as successful. The idea behind the e-reader was that you would plug it into your Game Boy Advance, swipe the collectible card, and either get retro games from it, or add-ons to your other games. Sounds good, right? Wrong. Each card could only hold about 2.2 kilobytes of data, meaning that even the smallest games would have to span several cards to play them. Of course, the biggest problem came from add-on data to the games. Say you wanted to play the extra levels in Super Mario Advance 4. To get these levels, you would need a copy of the game, the card of the game itself, an e-reader, two Game Boy Advances so you can make the transfer, 
and a link cable to join them together. Does that seem like enough stuff to buy? While the e-reader was fairly successful in Japan, it was a flop in the States, only lasting a few years and never making it to Europe at all. This is definitely a case where Sega does what Nintendo don't. Number 6. The Sega Activator. Now motion control gaming is no new dream. Ever since the days of the NES and the good old Power Glove, we've dreamed of one-to-one -one motion controlling in our video games. Sega was the first ever company to attempt a full-body motion controller, and it definitely should not have been allowed to be released. Basically, the thing was a giant ring that you'd put on the floor that would then release a series of infrared beams. Now these beams would bounce back off the ceiling, so that when the beam was broken, the game would correspond this to a button press and perform the action. Now, the ring was mapped to a 3-button Mega Drive controller, but did not allow for the 6-button controller to be used. You know, the kind that Sega pretty much invented so that, you know, fighting games would work on the Sega Mega Drive? Another big problem was that button combinations were not supported by the Sega Activator, which meant if you wanted to, I don't know, do a jump kick, you'd better grab that controller because you're not doing that in that ring. So between the poor controls, the fact the thing could only be used in a flat, non-reflective environment, the fact that the ring was only supported by three games, count them three whole games, it needed a separate 9 volt power supply to work, and was priced at $80 at launch. It's no surprise that this thing sold poorly and was discontinued sometime later. Again, we see a case where using the regular controller was so much better than some rubbish experimental hardware. Number 5. The Namco Jogcon. Namco, have you ever heard of the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it? Well, in 1995, Namco released the NEG-Con, a strange controller that had a pivot in the centre. Now, while this may seem incredibly stupid, the controller actually works surprisingly well with many racing games on the PS1, and is a very fondly remembered controller by gamers. Of course, Namco couldn't let a good thing be left alone, and in 1998, they released the sequel controller, if that thing could ever exist, the Jogcon. Now, the Jogcon was designed to combine the function of a steering wheel controller while maintaining the size of a standard PlayStation controller. This was done by putting a big dial right in the centre of the controller. I'd say roughly where the analogue sticks would go. Now, while this dial was the first force feedback steering wheel available on the PlayStation, that's where the positives end. The thing was pretty difficult to use, as it meant you'd be twisting the thing with your thumb, which you could only turn so far with it, or you'd have to turn it like a volume dial, which took one hand off the controller. The controller was not well received, and due to the odd design of the thing, it was only compatible with Ridge Racer 4 and 5. A steering wheel only compatible with two games. Can you see the problem here? Just stick with a regular steering wheel. Number 4. The PlayStation Mouse. Now, everyone remembers how fun it was to use the SNES mouse with Mario Paint and Civilization, don't they? So why shouldn't the same thing work for the PS1? Well, there's a lot of reasons why. For one, the mouse was of a notoriously poor quality, being made of a very cheap recycled plastic that meant one drop could easily shatter this thing. There's also very little in terms of compatible games, only about, I'd say about two or three dozen games. And while there were good games in that group that used the mouse, like Command and Conquer and Doom, those were just PC ports that were already designed around the mouse. And your exclusives for the PS1 mouse were piles of rubbish like Clock Tower 2, The Struggle Within. Ugh. Overall, it was a nice idea, but by the time the DualShock controller came out, you could wrap this mouse up and put it away with all the other crud on this list. Number 3. The Resident Evil 4 Chainsaw Controller. Now, I'm not gonna lie, when I was younger and found out the first time that this thing existed, I wanted one. Badly. I mean, look at it, it looks awesome. Luckily, I never got one, as this thing just screams of style over substance. While the thing looks cool on a shelf, just like the characteristics, the minute you try and use the thing to play a game, the faults come through. Namely, this thing is heavy. Using this thing for more than half an hour is gonna strain your arms, so unless you're playing on a table, regular breaks are needed. Also, with the way the thing is designed, using the analog sticks is difficult if you're trying to use the control like, oh, I don't know, the same way a regular DualShock controller works? In conclusion, 
This thing looks great in a collection, but the controller part of this actual controller is sadly where things fall flat. Number 2. The Wii Bowling Ball. Oh god, not this thing. Now, there are a lot of Wii peripherals out there that are shaped like sporting equipment, like tennis rackets and golf clubs. On the whole, these things are cheaply made, way too light to feel realistic, and are just wastes of money. The biggest waste of money, however, has to be the Wii Bowling Ball. Basically, all you do with this one is plug your Wii Remote inside of the ball and... use it to play bowling games! Woohoo! Now, what do you do with a bowling ball? You bowl it, right? What's the one thing you shouldn't be doing with a Wii Remote? Throwing it across the room, that's what! Now, this thing isn't meant to be thrown. Not that the fact it's, you know, a bowling ball would cue you into that. So, if you don't have a wrist strap with your Wii Remote, be prepared to put holes in your TV, your wall, your windows, and most likely, your friends. In terms of being a controller, the thing sucked as well. The B button, which, if you've ever played Wii Sports, you need to hold in order to start bowling, was almost impossible to reach when your fingers were in the ball holes. And if you're left-handed, forget about it. Being left-handed made this thing all but unusable, due to the positions of the buttons. In the end, this is just a peripheral that served to make the gaming experience even worse than it was before. And given that this thing cost £13 at launch, you're best just sticking with the good old-fashioned Wiimote. Before we get to number one, let's have a quick recap. At number 10, it's the southpaw stick that makes hands sick, it's the master system control stick. At number 9, it's the microphone that should be left alone, it's we speak. At number 8, it's the joystick with only one trick, it's the cheater characteristics. At number 7, it's the card that should be barred, it's the Nintendo e-reader. At number 6, it's no fun and it makes Kinect look one-to-one, -one. it's the Sega Activator. At number 5, it's the DAR that ain't got no style, it's the Namco Jogcon. At number 4, it's the mouse you don't want in the house, it's the PlayStation Mouse. At number 3, it's the chainsaw that we should all agree should be made against the law, it's the Resident Evil 4 chainsaw. And at number 2, it's the unusable ball we are not meant to roll down the hall, it's the Wii Bowling Ball. And at number 1, it's the Capcom Soul Controller. No, this isn't some rubbish Wiimote add-on, this came out in 2004 for the PS2. This was a controller that was released to coincide with the release of Onimusha 3, and was a 3-foot plastic katana sword, complete with a sheath and everything. Now, as this katana was, you know, a katana made for a Japanese samurai game, as you expect, the main gimmick of it was that there was a simple gyroscope inside the controller that, when you swung, would attack the enemy on the screen. Of course, this wasn't a one-to-one -one sort of thing like Skyward Sword, this was basically, you swing it, the attack button happens, but, you know, 2004, I can cut it a little bit of slack. Now, the handle of this controller was mapped to every button on the PS2 controller, which means that technically this thing is compatible with every PS2 game in existence. Although why you would want to play your PS2 games with this thing is a another question entirely. Of course, this is where the positives, if you can call them that, end. As you can imagine, playing a game with a three-foot katana sword isn't going to be easy, so most people just remove the blade, which by that virtue means that you're not even using the thing as a katana anymore, and by that, why don't you just pick up a DualShock controller? Another big problem, it was wireless only. Why is this a problem? I don't know, maybe the fact that a battery would only last about five hours on a full charge, which, for a game as long as Unimusha 3, means you're going to be unplugging and charging this thing up for ages at a time. Another big problem, the thing was a very cheap and plasticky thing. This wouldn't be what you'd expect from someone like Capcom, would you? You'd expect it to be released in 2012 for the Wii. Oh, and you want to know what the real kicker is? The thing that made me put this at number one on the list? Guess how much this thing retailed for in 2004? Doesn't matter what you guessed, you're wrong. This thing cost between $150 and $200. That's right, you could buy a brand new PS2 at this time for the cost of this piece of cack. It's because of this, and all the other problems, I think I'm right in declaring this the worst peripheral of all time.